Hello everyone and welcome back to, well, the game that you can see before you, the Masters of the Universe Battleground by Archon Studio. After the viewer verdict, which a lot of people wanted to see a bit more of, we're going to play a full game today using the contents of the starter set, which is also on the box there. A standard game is meant to be 100 points. If you use all five models with their basic equipment, it comes to just over 100. It's like 102, 103, something like that. We're going to let that slide and just use all the content today and uh, hopefully correct a couple of fairly large errors off of the viewer verdict, one that was caught in editing and one that was not. Uh, but before we go over that, let's go look at the two sides. So the side of good today is, from left to right, He-Man, Orko, Ram Man, Man-at-Arms, and Stratos, again, all using their basic equipment. He-Man has the Sword of Power. Orko just has a spell that's a little bit variable called Cosmic Storm. Ram Man has an axe. Man-at-Arms has a mace and an arm cannon and Stratos has his flamethrower. You might notice two objective tokens sitting beside him. In a standard game, this was not done in the tutorial game because it doesn't tell you to do this. There's one default objective on the table to start with, and then you have two per side, and one is placed in your deployment, and one is placed in the enemy deployment. And cloaked in a little bit of shadow, which is very dramatic, but also makes him a little hard to see, we have the baddies. From left to right, we have Skeletor with Havoc Staff Magic Blast. Then we have Merman with his Trident. We have Trapjaw with his hook attachment that he can turn into a laser. We have Evelyn with Shadow Strike, which is a spell, range 12. She's like firing a mystical sword. And then we have Triclops, who has just a bog standard long sword as well. So five models per side, two objectives per side, and that covers the basics, uh, the fate decks. You use specific ones in the tutorial mission, which we did for the viewer verdict. In general, you can make a deck of any and on that note both sides have mixed so you might see some good side tokens if on a dark side card or evil side whatever that doesn't matter those tokens are purely for the tutorial any side can use any card and here's a relatively good look at the layout we're using today it's called ancient ruins it's from the battleground book that comes alongside the rule book one thing to note the ladders are not in the right place i glued those ladders on i did not realize they were variable so unfortunately this one looks very misplaced the other one fits kind of but yeah, they were meant to be movable, I did not know that, and I haven't risked ripping them off yet. Anyway, during editing, I caught last time that uh, once you do a kind of initiative fight between activations, and you do both those activations, you're actually supposed to do another activation fight over who gets to go first. It's not just back and forwards for the whole thing. If one side has ran out of activations, then sure, the one side that hasn't gets to keep going. But that does mean there'll be a lot more fate card plays, to see who gets to activate first out of every pairing of activations. That was caught in editing. The thing that wasn't caught in editing and was caught like days later randomly when I was streaming a video game, it just suddenly came to me. It's like in Home Alone when the mother just suddenly realizes Kevin was left in the attic. I think she's on the plane when it happens. It was like that. So just a sudden moment of, oh no, six is exploding this game. If you roll a six, which is a crit, you get an extra die, kind of similar to Crisis Protocol and plenty of other, other stuff. But not only that, crits can explode. You can go perpetually if you keep rolling sixes. You can roll so many dice if you get very lucky. So that will be done correctly today, but obviously the game is still new to the channel, so keep that in mind. There might still be mistakes. With that, both sides are going to get set up while you watch this quick word from my channel's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Noble Knight Games. Check out the video description below for an affiliate link that will take you through to their store, and it will help me out as well. Thanks. And with that done, my channel sponsor does uh, carry this game for the record. Both sides are set up. We've got Stratos over here, Orko, Ram Man, Man at Arms, He-Man. And then at the far end of the table, in fact we can zoom in a little bit, we can see from left to right, Merman has deployed next to Evelyn, Skeletor, Trapjaw, and Triclops. And you can see kind of where the two objectives they've placed are. One behind Evelyn, one behind Triclops. And if we just pan back out and look down a little bit, we can see... One behind He-Man, and one over here on the left, next to Stratos. Again, you can't cap your own objectives in your deployment line. You have to have either the central one, or one in the enemy deployment zone. And we can cover like what counts as contested. Again, we, we covered it last time, but we'll do it if it ha happens here. They have to be at least six hexes away from each other, and three in from the battlefield edges, but still within your deployment. That's the rules for the additional ones placed. So with that, we'll go to the first little power struggle playing cards. Out of the five fake cards you draw and the two side objectives you'll have, and let's see how this plays out. 
the first fates have been picked. Left side is always going to be the goodies, right side is always going to be the baddies. Again, if they have the opposing symbol on the card now, it does not matter. That's purely for the tutorial. So the good guys have played a 7 initiative, the bad guys have played a 5 initiative. So the good guys are going first, 2 AP, 1 MP, and then 1 choice of one of these, just as a reminder of how the cards work. And we'll cover any specifics that matter as we go, but otherwise we're going to save a bit of time by not going over every single card other than showing it off. So with that card in play, Man at Arms had 2 AP as just mentioned, 1 MP by a the card and then he chose an additional MP from the two alternatives on the bottom of the card the boosts. He immediately spent 1 AP and 1 MP on Master Tactician, you test power plus 1, he is normally 2 power so it's roll 3 dice and again everything in this game is looking for a 4 plus unless you have some buff or debuff that affects what's called the scope of the roll and that means that the next ally to activate this round is just going to be given 2 MP by his Master Tactician ability. For his other AP he just did a bog standard move which is 5 hexes and then he ended his activation at which point his always vigilant passive kicked in. At the end of his activation if there's no enemies within 8 he gains an overwatch. So he has done exactly that and that's his turn over but he'll be able to shoot at someone if they come into view. For the baddies Triclops activated first taking 2 AP, no MP but then from the secondary boost options taking 1 MP from that because the other one isn't applicable right now. And for his first action he did a boost which let him use his faster movement speed of 6, he's still pretty slow and he is just pushed down there roughly towards He-Man and avoiding this kind of middle corridor bit here so that Man at Arms can't just shoot at him with Overwatch. So then we're right back to a fake card showdown again, the good guys on the left, that is initiative 5 versus initiative 1, so it's once again the good guys going with an actual good guy card from the tutorial. Massive 4 AP, but there's only one secondary boost and it's actually a negative. During this activation, minus one die for all attack tests and also no MP. But remember, Master Man at Arms rather is giving 2 MP to whoever activates because of his Vigilant. And there's a look at the Villainous card as well if you're curious. So second to activate for the good guys was Ram Man. He tried to make something happen, so he was given 2 MP as a result of the thing Man at Arms did. He had 4 AP to play with, he spent 1 on a movement action, then he spent 2 on another movement action because he's repeating an action so the cost goes up by 1 and that got him to roughly here. Then he spent his last AP from that card plus the 2 MP given to him by Always Vigilant to do Human Battering Ram, oh, sorry Ramming Speed rather. You make a free move action plus 2 up to a maximum of 6 which is how much he moved. And then after you come to a stop, all enemies within two hexes, you test your toughness versus their defense. And if you get at least one success, you stun them. And unfortunately for him, it turns out Triclops is actually pretty tanky himself. So it was four dice per side. Uh, one dice was a fail on his defense, but that six exploded into another. Oh, actually it exploded into another six, but it doesn't matter because he's already fully blocked it. There was zero successes, so no stun on Triclops. And that's Ram Man done with. Trapjaw activated. This was the card again. Two action points and just taking one magic point from the boosts. He spent that to convert to the laser attachment. One EP was spent on a movement of five hexes, which got him where you can see him. At which point, Men at Arms, Overwatch triggered. You increase the scope by one, so he's looking for fives, not fours. And as a result, that means oh, that's a whiff. So no defense roll was even bothered to roll. Trapjaw still has one action left and thanks to that laser attachment he can now do a ranged attack of his own so we'll be back once that's rolled out. As a reminder because of the number of dice that come with the game sometimes failures will be taken away from a roll to be used for a defence roll uh, but Trapjaw had two exploding sixes they didn't further explode but he still ended up with five successes. Man at Arms luckily he rolls quite a lot for his defence four dice and he managed to get three successes so that meant two uh, successes got through and that just means one damage. The laser attachment is one success for one damage, three successes for two damage so the two that got through falls in the middle and does the lower of the two values. Still one damage though and the overwatch was a bit of a whiff but either way back to the next clash. And here we go good guys card is initiative four, three AP, whoops as I dropped the card down, no MP at all though. And then the villain card 
is seven so the villains will be going first this time two ep and then a choice of either interruptions and in actions close combat attacks costing uh, one less or one mp off of that so it was evelyn that used this card taking the one mp from the secondary effects for her first ap she did a move and she can move up to five on a standard move action and from where she is she can actually target orko which is what she did uh, specifically for ranged attacks i'm not sure i've ever talked about that on camera specifically but you measure from the hex to the hex using that the targets in using the ruler you don't count the individual hexes so i think i've also been doing that a bit wrong myself but you use the ruler provided um which you can just about see up here so she's got a range of 12 on her magic and he is within roughly 10 and a half so she could use shadow strike for the one mp she generated it's her power stat versus the target's mind stat so it was five dice in total versus three she only got two successes and oracle managed two successes as well oracle starts the game with three magic by the way he doesn't even need to use it for the one spell he has but the spell he has can do a bunch of random stuff because he's not super great with magic uh, but the, uh, the mp he has though he can use it to give extra dice or extra rerolls rather to allies within a certain distance of him so he's, he's more useful as a buff character than an attack character but anyway, that is Evelyn's action over. So speaking of Oracle, the little court mage, he activated and this was his card. He had three AP to play with, no additional MP, but he starts with a bunch. Not that he needs it, needed it. For his first AP, he did a move action and for his second, which got him there, he used his one magic spell called Cosmic Storm on He-Man. It does a bunch of stuff. You get to pick based on the number of successes you have to play with. So he rolls a massive six dice and all but one came up with four pluses. In fact, he just rolled fours. I presume you still have to do the test if an ally is getting hit. So He-Man did that six re-rolled into an additional miss, which is why there's no extra die there. And that means in total he has three successes. So he can do up to one of these things. For one success, you can gain more MP, two to be exact. If you have at least two successes, you can deal one damage. Or if you have at least three successes, you can choose to teleport a target three hexes. And that is the one he is doing on He-Man. One, two, three. He is teleporting He-Man forwards, positioning him such that he might be able to go clobber Triclops during his activation. He has one AP left. He hasn't got anything else to do, and that isn't enough to do another movement action. So he is going to focus and use that defensively. In case he needs to oh actually he has to face the person he's cast the spell on so he will keep facing that way which is a little dangerous oh well and the next fate card is being played the good guys card has a four initiative three action points one mp the villains are four oh we're gonna have to do a roll off with three is this the same card it's literally the same card for both sides okay it'll be a roll off so we'll be back with whoever wins activating so with this card in play there it is if you want to read it and again both sides are using the same one he might activate, he doesn't get the MP because he only generates MP if he focuses, which is what he did for 1 AP. So he had 1 MP and the focus token which he used to move at his maximum speed of 8, and that got him right next to Triclops there. He, for the last AP, swung the Sword of Power into him, normally 5 dice. He used his ability on the Sword of Power to spend that 1 MP to get 6 dice. The 6 did explode into nothing, so he only had 2 successes sadly, that could have been so much damage. And Triclops rolls four defense dice, only blocked one. So one success still got through, and that means one damage to Triclops, who has five health, so he's got four left. I'm going to double check that multiple combatants don't lower the scope. I don't think it does. And presuming it doesn't, we'll just be back in the villain's turn. So second last activation for the bad guys was Skeletor, and he had one MP from that card, because he can get them. He spent one on a boost. Spent his second AP of the three he was given to move boosted. He moves the same speed as He-Man, which is eight when he's sprinting. That got him to the objective in the center of a table. He then spent his last AP and one MP on Magic Blast into Man-at-Arms, rolling a total of five dice versus four, uh, sorry, three. No, wait, no, it was two originally, wasn't it? Yeah, that's why it was so impressive. Man-at-Arms originally rolled two dice. One of them was a six, so it exploded into an additional die that was also a six. That one didn't explode into a success, but still, that was pretty impressive. It meant that only one total success was counted, and that means Magic Blast does zero. It has to do at least two to do any damage. So Man at Arms tanked that like a boss. 
So this is the last clash of cards for the first round because there's one character left to go for each side. That's a very fast initiative 7 for the good guys versus a very, very slow initiative of just 1 for the villains. So Stratos will be using that card and Merman will be using that card. So simple activation for Stratos down this end of the table. He only had 2 AP to play with. He boosted and then with that moved his maximum speed of 9 which got him right up to the corner here. Puts him in the danger zone for Merman potentially reaching him but he's got a lot of ground to cover and we know from last time he's not super good for damage. He is better for moving around. And there wasn't much for Merman to do. He didn't want to really sprint at Stratos because Stratos could just fly over him next round. So he just spent one AP to do a normal move, which got him there. It means he has one leftover AP. Yeah, he could focus, but those go away at the end of the round anyway, which is where we are now. So just doing nothing else. And that takes us to the scoring. Not much to cover at the end of round one. I did forget to mention from both those cards just played by either side, Stratos took one MP from the choices of the secondary boosts and so did Merman. So they both are sitting on one MP. Anyway, the only scoring to be had at the end of the round is Skeletor. He has hold, held the central objective there. No one else is touching it. No one else is touching him. So he has secured it for 20 victory points. Both sides do have two optional side objective cards they can play at some point as well that can give them some bonus victory points if it's achieved, just like last time. Anyway, into round two with a new hand of fate cards drawn. So top of round two of a four round game, if you aren't aware or have forgotten from last time. First fate card then, also forgot to mention on camera again, but this was covered in the first video. The Havoc Staff that Skeletor is equipped with gives him one mana every time one of his underlings suffers damage. Anywho, good guy card is a massive initiative 9 and the bad guys card is an actual higher initiative 10 so the bad guys will be going first only 1 AP and 2 MP on both cards and then a choice of specials so it turns out Skeletor can be pretty scary he's used up every single die the game comes with he gained 2 mana from that card he had 1 on him from um, Triclops getting hurt and he took one additional mana from the boost options on the card. He spent that to do Magic Blast on Man at Arms again. If after you've spent to cast the spell you still have more mana than the target, you gain two extra dice. So he was rolling seven dice and he rolled some crits, if it isn't obvious, which then converted into some more dice and some more crits in one case at least. So yeah, he's rolled a total, well that's not a success, but that's two, four, six, eight. He's rolled nine successes. And Man at Arms gets what? It's two defense dice against magic attacks? Yeah, he has a mind of two. So let's just two, four, six, eight, nine. So nine versus, yeah, nothing. So that's nine successes, which means it's doing maximum possible damage, which is five plus, and that's three damage. That is, uh, that's pretty powerful. Man at Arms has one health left. Ow! That's all Skeletor's turn though, because there was only one AP, but good grief. Well, first up for the Forces of Good is going to be He-Man. That does put Man at Arms at a risky position, but had to do this because the card was too perfect for him. It gives a focus for, for free, which means, one, that he has to spend it when he initiates an attack, which is what he spent his one AP on. Makes the scope better, so he was looking for three pluses, not four pluses. Plus, because he's He-Man, he generates MP by gaining that focus. So he spent that on an extra die again with the Sword of Power. So he was rolling six dice against Triclops. Looking for three pluses instead of four pluses. He had a couple of explodes in case that isn't obvious. Triclops' defense roll was okay. He had one explode, which translated into a second success. Again, because of dice limitations. That's why there's only two there. He does roll four dice. But that means he only blocks two, which means five successes still get through. So the Sword of Power does its maximum damage possibility of 3. So he gave as good as Skeletor did. And that is Triclops up to 4 damage. He is also a 5 health model though. So he has 1 left. Alright, next set of activations. The good guys are playing one of their secondary objectives. Which will potentially give 20 victory points if a physical attack is used to knock out an enemy. And it has a massive 10 on the initiative track. But, snap, so do the villains, so it's going to have to be a roll-off again. Basically the same card, with the exception that it has to be a ranged attack. So obviously this is going to be for Trapjaw to try and kill Man-at-Arms. Both sides are going for a kill worth 20 victory points each. 
there's really just, it doesn't matter who goes first really since it's two different fights, but let's do the roll off and then we'll be back with the outcome. Man, that was so close to being disastrous for the forces of evil. So Trapjaw, he had two EP to play with. He spent one on a range attack and then used up the other one as part of the laser attachment he has, where you can spend an extra EP to get two additional dice. So he was rolling seven dice and didn't get a single crit, so no exploding dice, but he did get two successes. Not super great. Man at Arms is rolling four defense dice and the whole roll, I think, there is visible. He had one stinking success, which means one success still gets through for Trapjaw, which is enough that his attack does one damage. And that means that Man at Arms is out of there. So not only does that mean victory points are scored equal to the value of Man at Arms and his arm cannon and mace, but an additional 20 are scored for taking out an enemy with a ranged attack. So uh, Ram Man better kill Triclops to kind of even that out. And thankfully for the forces of good, Ram Man was able to do it. He's equipped with a mace, you'd think, he, or sorry, an axe rather, which has the special rule if you use a focus to attack, you gain one extra die. So he had two EP to play with, he focused, lowering the scope down to a three plus, got an extra die, so he was rolling five in total, and swung into Triclops. Getting a total of three successes versus just a single success on defense. So two successes got through, that's still only one damage. He needs uh, one success is one damage, three or more is two, and two successes obviously falls in the middle, so you go back down to one. But that is still enough that Triclops is out of there. So again, 20 victory points for the side objective, but that just counters out the evil side doing the same thing. And then the value of Triclops plus his gear. All right, both sides heating up. Down a man each. Let's see what's happening now. A, a five initiative for the goodies. And a 9 initiative for the bad guys, so it is the bad guys going next. With the cards you can hopefully about make out on your screen. So there was a bit of a miscalculation with Merman's activation because he was one heck shy of a normal movement action for 1 EP. Getting into base to base with Strandos, his plan was then to hit him. Still activated him though and did a focus to move uh, maximum speed, which is 9, which is more than enough to get into base to base. Couldn't attack him, but what he could do was spend the 1 EP here on freezing ray you test power versus mind and as long as you get at least one success you root them and he tried he got one but stratos with a mind of three was able to dodge and that's after the explosion in point not he still just had two successes but that was good enough so that means if he wants to move away an attack of opportunity happens however i believe if you have something that places you like a teleport or in stratos's case he can fly depending on how much mp he has I think that doesn't trigger an attack opportunity. It does specify when you declare a movement action in the rulebook. If that's wrong, by all means let us know, but that does seem to be the case. Well, Merman wasn't the only one who messed up his counting. Stratos had a total of 3 MP after taking 2 from the card, plus 2 AP. He used 2 the sky to fly 3 hexes. Again, that's a placement from a special ability, so presumably that does not trigger an attack opportunity. If that's wrong, apologies. He then spent on a focus and did a focused move for 9. And unfortunately, it got him one hex away from being adjacent to the objective. So he's not going to be able to claim it this round. And that means that they're not going to pull back the difference that the baddies currently have from Skeletor claiming that objective round one. So that just leaves Oracle for them and Evil Inn for the villains. Let's go see which one of them is operating first. And here is the order. It's initiative five for the good guys. 3 AP, 2 MP, but you're not allowed to use Focus, which I've been calling Boost, mostly. <laughs> and then, oh, it's only Initiative 2, so it is Orko going first. Whoops. So it was not a great activation for Orko. He has a passive called Traveler from Trolla, which is, before you do a spell attack, you do his Mind plus 1 test, and you have to get at least two successes, or the spell has no effect, and that happened this time. It was after he did a move over to here, he wasn't allowed to Focus, he was going to use it on Evil Lynn to teleport her uh, three hexes further from Stratos, kind of in the middle so that no objective could be reached by her. But his spell has failed to go off. He's very bad at being a magician. So over to Evil Lynn. That was it. Waste of a turn. He does generate two MP on it, so he's sitting on five now. But that's it. Evil Lynn gave herself a focus along with three MP. She spent one of it on Shadow Strike. Didn't bother putting in extra dice for, or rather extra mana to generate extra dice. Felt like five was plenty. 
ended up with four successes after explodes taking away uh, misses. Stratos rolled his mind, which is three dice, only blocked one, so three successes got through, which means he takes two damage of his four health, so he just lost half his health to evil in blasting him. If the attack gets five or more successes, it does three damage. So that takes us to the end of the second round. And at the end of the second round, the only one to score anything for any objective is once again Skeletor in the middle, scoring another 20 right there. Both sides during that round scored 20 from doing one of their side objectives on a fate card. And that's it, so the forces of evil are now ahead by 40 points, which is rough. If Stratos had managed to touch that objective, it would have closed the gap a little bit. But, well, we've still got half a game to play, although it'll go a bit faster now that people are dying. And with that, let's jump into round three. All right, top of round three, penultimate round. Let's see what's happening. Is that an eight or a six? I can't see. That is an eight initiative for the good guys. A seven for the bad guys. So it will be one of the good guys activating with two action points. No MP, although they could gain one from there. Or during this activation or interruption, they can't themselves be interrupted. And unfortunately for the good guys, there wasn't much they could do with that turn. He-Man used a focus and then did a movement action, so he's gained one MP, as we've already discussed multiple times, and has moved, so he is touching that back objective, and unless anyone stands next to him or the objective itself, will count as holding it, so he might force somebody back, if nothing else. Well, Evelyn activated and made use of that card, taking the two action points, two MP, and a third MP there. That one was spent to do a magical blast. She focused to make the scope better by one, although it didn't really matter, because look at what she rolled. She had a couple of explodes in there as well. This is after everything's all sorted out and failures removed. She had five. Stratos, all said and done, only had two successes. And those three successes for Evelyn means that, that two more damage got through. And that is one less flightless man on the table. Stratos is defeated. So we'll worry about the victory points for each individual kill plus their equipment at the end if it matters. <laughs> at this rate it's not going to matter much. Um, I think the victory points are just two in the favour of the bad guys. But we'll still play on a little bit. And let's see how it's going next. That is an eight for the good guys. And well that's an eight for the villains. So it's going to be a roll off. Two action points, one MP. Two action points, zero MP. And then we'll see what happens with the boosts. Ram Man made use of that card after winning the actual roll-off and didn't have a good activation, unfortunately. He opted just to take an extra MP from the secondary effect of the card, so he got 2 MP in total, 2 AP. He did a movement action which got him to the corner there, then he spent his other AP plus the 2 MP he just gained on ramming speed to insert himself between Trapjaw and Skeletor. Did a test against both of them to try and stun them and failed on both accounts to even get a single success through the defense roll. So, nothing there. Because he is in contact, though, with Skeletor, Skeletor does not count as holding that objective. He hasn't activated yet, so he could absolutely still move, but that would trigger an attack of opportunity against him, unless he has some way of teleporting. And sneaking down this end of the table using that villain card, just taking the MP and the 2 AP, did a boost, and... Sorry, focus. I keep on calling it a boost, because it, it gives you boosts. Um, used focus, and then did a 9 hex move, did not get him close enough to be touching that objective, but he's definitely threatening it now, and Orko isn't going to be able to do much to defend it, I think. Well, let's see who's going first next, although keep in mind there's two bad guys who haven't gone yet, and only one hero, which means there won't be a, a clash after this. So it'll just be, they get to go. They're not allowed to be the first to activate for that side in the next round, though. That's how they kind of balance that. So it will be Orko doing something. <laughs> I mean, it's all RNG with him, so let's see if he can do something with 2 AP and a bunch of MP. And then either uh, Trapjaw or Skeletor will have 2 AP, 2 MP, and then another MP from the boost. So Oracle used Cosmic Storm, 6 dice, a couple of explodes in there, ended up with 5 successes. Evelyn only got 1, so he had 4 successes, so he could pick any effect from Cosmic Storm. He picked doing 1 damage. Why not? Then he spent one AP to focus and the other AP to actually move. Oh wait, no, he couldn't have focused because he only had two to play with, right? Uh, if this character had a focus at the beginning of their activation, they would have had one AP. Yeah, so he would actually have only been able to move five, not eight. So he's actually going to be three back. One, two, three. He's actually going to be there, 
which is even worse. At least when he was base to base with Evelyn, that would stop her zapping him at range. But there, he's just in the open. Ugh. Well, Trapjaw used the card for the baddies, 2 EP, 2 MP, well, 3 MP. He paid 1 to switch to his hook attachment so he could do a melee attack. He focused and then struck. He only gets 3 dice. One of them exploded into another success, however. And if we come around here, we can see that the dice are definitely favouring one side over the other. Ramman has 4 defence dice and still only managed 1 success. That means 3 successes for Trapjaw, which means 2 damage to Ramman. He is very tanky though. He has six health. That's even more than He-Man. I think that may be... Yeah, that's the most in the set entirely. So, he's got four left. He's not exactly hurting, but he's in a bad spot if Skeletor decides to blast him. On that note, it is going to be over to Skeletor because everybody else is activated. So there's not going to be a, a flip against a different card. It's just what card he wants to use. So this is the card Skeletor played. He took one MP from here, which he used on his passive, well not passive, his ability called Lord of Destruction, which means he's allowed to use his magical ranged attack in close range. And then he had two EP. He spent one EP to initiate a magic blast attack at point blank range into Ramman, and guess what, what Ramman's weakness is? He rolls one defense die against magic attacks. That's what he's weak against. Skeletor should technically be facing him, but he is going to be doing something else in a second. But hey, you, you, when you do an, a magic attack, you face the person you're hitting. So, after spending the cost to do the Magical Blast, he still had more MP than Ram Man, so that's two additional dice on top of his five. So he was rolling seven, and he rolled a bunch of crits. One crit turned into a crit. He ended up with six successes. The one defense die Ram Man had was a success, so that removes that. But that still leaves five successes, which is three damage. Enough to kill even He-Man, but Ram Man is alive on one health remaining. Now Skeletor does want to use that other AP. He is going to move. He is going to move here, because that will mean neither he nor the objective is being touched, which means it will score. But him pulling away lets Ram Man do a free attack of opportunity. So we're going to resolve that. The scope is one worse, but he might at least do something. You know, and he actually did pretty well, considering he needed five pluses, he got a couple of sixes, and that exploded into one more success. Skeletor only got one block, so that means two got through it, still just one damage, but hey, it's something. So Skeletor has taken one of his five health, and that takes us to the end of the penultimate round. And with that, I think the winner is basically decided we're going to do just the start of the final round, see who gets initiative, because if it is Team Evil, Team Baddies, and they take out Ram Man, which will just take one damage. Um, Oracle and He-Man themselves will not be able to close the gap. At, like, even if they went on a murder spree somehow, they would still not be able to close the gap. Such as it is at the end of this round, Skeletor is claiming the middle objective again. He-Man is claiming the back objective though, so that's 20 points gained each. So they kind of overwrite each other, or write each other off I should say. With that, let's jump into the top of the final round. Well, top of the final round, and I think this is going to be the decider here. Good guy's card is initiative 8, 2 AP, 1 MP, and then the potential boosts. The enemy card is 10, though, so that means an enemy will be going first. Only 1 AP, 1 MP, but it's going to be Skeletor blasting him because Ram Man's magic defense is so bad. So unless this is a ridiculous whiff of a roll on 7 dice, I think he's about to die. Yeah, well, would you look at that? Skeletor had a total of four successes through Ram Man's one defense against magic was a whiff. Four successes means that Magical Blast is doing two damage. Needed to be five or more to do three. Still enough, though, that Ram Man is out of there. I mean, that is probably game, but we might as well play that hero objective first. Because, again, no matter what Oracle and He-Man are able to do, they just can't cover that point spread, especially because Merman is in the bottom left of the table just going to sit on an objective. So it was actually Oracle that used that card because he could use a focus and then a 8 hex move and that got him adjacent to that other objective. Again, not enough to cover the spread, but even if He-Man had charged into Trapjaw, the most damage he would be able to do is 3. Trapjaw's got 4 health, uh, or 5 health. Either way, he would not die to a single hit. So that's probably it. But let's have a quick look. Yep, upon looking at the board state, it is basically a concede here. During the next clash, no matter who goes first, uh, during the baddies, Evelyn can activate. Oh, I did it. I said I called her Evelyn instead of Evelyn. Evelyn can activate, and she can actually achieve their secondary objective during her turn, uh, which is 
During a single activation or interruption, you use at least 5 magic for 10 victory points. She would have exactly 5 when activating with that particular card. And she could spend 1 on Dark Presence, which is just a way to poison somebody, I think. And then she can spend 1 to do Shadow Strike. And she can boost it up to 3 times to get extra dice. Probably kill Orko in the process, because he only has 3 health. And it can do 3 damage. So... That would have been his kill worth of points, plus the 10 for doing another secondary objective. Skeletor is uncontested in the middle. That writes off one of the two objectives Orko and He-Man is sitting on. And down in this end of the table, Merman just needs to boom, and he's sitting there. So, we are going to call this a, a villainous victory today. Skeletor has triumphed over good, and that takes us to the end. Let's close on some final thoughts. So hopefully more things were done correctly there. Didn't forget the using the cards every time to activate. Exploding sixes definitely changed the flow of the game. It leads to spikes, obviously, and makes things a lot more variable and less easy to gauge how much you're likely to get out of an attack where you're rolling a bunch of four pluses, which is obviously 50-50 chance per die. Get that six, though, that can throw stuff off. I was also surprised how often sixes rolled into other sixes which exploded again granted most of the time that was into a miss but still it does change having those exploding sixes and remembering about them in terms of points incidentally prior to anything happening in that round and not even counting any kills um the baddies were up to 80 victory points the good guys were up to 40 but obviously the bad guys had a bunch more kills and that's at least like roughly 18 points per kill and as we talked through no matter the board state at the end there. The bad guys were taking that. Nyeh etc. Skeletor wins. That was fun though. Uh, a bit long compared to the viewer verdict I suppose because it was a full five side and technically over the point limit but you'd think the the stuff in the core box would be a hundred on the dot for each side. It is not. I guess maybe if you if you took away magic blast for Skeletor and one of Man at Arms weapons that would probably even out at just below 100 each side, but then Skeletor wouldn't have a magic option for a magic user, which doesn't seem particularly fair, and Man at Arms would obviously only be at half capability, so I think I'd rather pay, play just over 100, and it was just over 100 per side, it was like 102 to be exact, so it's not too bad. But, let me know what you thought of a full-size game. Um, it did feel like the heroes were on the back foot there. Orko seems relatively useless. I think his main goal, we didn't really see it there, is his ability to make defence rolls better, but couldn't really use it there because of just where he happened to end up and the person he was with died too quickly. Because he has the... Uh, Orko may spend the magic on him to add one extra die to defence tests. Yeah. Oh, it's only within 8 inches of him as well. Presumably line of sight applies to that as well. So that was just a bit of a mistake with using him, but beyond that, he isn't really capable of doing any damage. But that, there's a bunch of additional heroes for both sides, and other factions as well, obviously. This is just what was in the core box. Either way, thank you very much for watching to the end, those of you that did. Hope you enjoyed. Please do remember to share your support if you want to see more. Uh, liking the video, commenting, that all helps. And subscribing, obviously, as well. If you want to go above and beyond to support the channel in general, consider becoming a channel member. You get early access to certain video series, and you get a little icon and some other stuff like that, and some exclusive videos as well. Or you can check out the channel sponsor via my affiliate link. If you buy anything after clicking through from there, I get compensated. They carry this game. They carry a few of the additional expansions. I don't think they have the complete set, but they definitely have some. So you can go give it a look. Either way, thank you for watching, and ta-ta for now.